Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, today it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Peter Martin. Uh, Dr. Martin received his PhD from Penn State University in uh, Human Development and Family Studies and uh, he is currently a professor at Iowa State in Gerontology, Human Development and Family Studies. Uh, Dr. Martin has uh, kindly accepted our invitation today to uh, provide us with a view of uh, fatigue and frailty among the oldest of old. And uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Martin. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here and thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I, I would love to say it's good to see all of you, but I can't. So <laughs> during these difficult times, I can't even see myself. All I see is a slide here. Uh, and that's quite all right. So hopefully uh, I can convey some of my thoughts with you on fatigue and frailty um, uh, by the end of uh, this, uh, this afternoon. Thanks again for inviting me. The topic of fatigue and frailty is not one that I came, came naturally to. I, I, uh, I'm trained as a psychologist and as a gerontologist, and, um, uh, and we don't typically look at fatigue or frailty. That's uh, really considered to be a physical component uh, that we leave to physicians, uh, rightly so. Um, and uh, we are more interested in mental health issues as, as psychologists and lifestyle issues. But I must tell you, um, I've worked with many, many very old people. Uh, my specialty is working with centenarians, people who are 100 years and older. And in having visited uh, many, many of them, I kept being um, quite surprised how um, active, energetic, uh, and um, uh, and uh, engaged uh, many of these centenarians were. And I did not see any obvious uh, fatigue. They were not tired, at least not when they talked with me. Maybe some frailty, uh, some physical decline, but uh, many of them also sharing with me the type of exercises that they do, the many walks that they take. And here you have people who are 100 years and older. And I've studied them in the United States. I've studied centenarians in Europe, uh, where I grew up, and in Japan uh, more recently because of their high longevity rates. And, uh, and again, I, I kept being so surprised that many of them seem extraordinarily fit. And then, uh, of course, with my interest in mental health issues, I looked at... Uh, issues of depression and depressive symptoms. Um, and um, when we did the analysis with our first two rounds of centenarians, it appeared as though there were high levels and high degrees of depression. And uh, that was surprising to our team because that was not the image or the experience we had when interviewing uh, centenarians. Um, many of them, most of them really did not seem depressed uh, to us. How could this be? How could we have these high scores uh, in, uh, in uh, depressivity uh, and, and not see that in our uh, daily engagement? Um, for me and for my interviewers who went out, we have tested more than 700 centenarians alone in my lab and I've worked in other labs. Well, as you'll see uh, in a little bit when I share my results with you, what uh, we found out uh, was that it wasn't really dysphoria or the sadness component of depression that accounted for these high depression scores. It was uh, the fatigue scores. Because most depression um, assessments include uh, items of uh, fatigue, exhaustion, energy. Uh, and of course, if you ask uh, somebody who's 20, 40, or even 60, uh, whether they are tired all the time, and whether it takes a lot, lot of energy to get going in the morning, then that will be different than asking a centenarian. But more on that later. This motivated us to really think about fatigue and then also frailty in a little bit more detail with this very, very old, uh, old age group. But uh, let me uh, outline the five points I would like to make today in the time that I have. Uh, we'll start uh, with demographic changes because when I talk about the oldest old or the emergence of the oldest old, uh, I always uh, like to uh, show the demographic changes we are experiencing right now for this particular age group. And uh, when we look at frailty and fatigue, uh, this is perhaps um, one of the groups we would think of as uh, being most, most at risk when it comes to frailty and fatigue. Uh, I would like to um, uh, go over some of the definitions and components of frailty. Maybe some of you already know uh, Linda Fried's work, but uh, some of you may not. Again, I, I should not assume anything, so I'll... I'll cover that very briefly. Uh, also the prevalence uh, and the predictors of, of frailty 
that we have. But I want to fairly soon move then over to one aspect of frailty, which you'll see is fatigue, because from my personal experiences and from the follow-up studies that we did and that I'll share with you, I've become convinced that fatigue is one of the key components that predicts decline uh, in late life and in very late life and at the end of life. And so if you want to maximize what we call health span, keeping people healthy physically and mentally uh, as long as possible uh, until the very end of their life, then really working on matters of fatigue seems to be very, very important. And so I worked together with uh, Warren Frankie in our kinesiology department here at Iowa State and some others to uh, initiate and test uh, what we call a home-based exercise uh, program. And uh, thinking that if fatigue is um, an important um, aspect of, uh, of decline in late life, then is there something we can do about it? Can we change, can we reverse, or can we uh, fatigue and can we maintain levels of strength? And because the oldest old population is not likely to go out to a lot of fit fitness centers, some of them are, but certainly not, we don't see too many centenarians there or even nonagenarians, people in their 90s. Uh, we were thinking, well, if we want to do something about fatigue in this particular age group, uh, the uh, exercise program that builds and maintains strength should be at home. And can we, can we test such a program out and doesn't make any difference? And so through uh, the Healthiest Initiative, we developed uh, this particular program, and I will uh, tell you what it is about in a little bit and what the effect of it was uh, for, uh, for our participants in here. So these are the five points I'd like to cover today. And I'll, of course, I hope there's uh, time at the end of my presentation for you to ask any questions you may ask or to interact with me on these topics. So the first point was to talk about demographic changes and to focus on the oldest old. My research lab here at Iowa State has really focused on this group. Of course, as geontologists, we're interested in aging at any age, much earlier even than 60 or 70. But the research lab that I run is the Exceptional Longevity uh, Research Lab, in which we study uh, this particular age group uh, that's been considered uh, the oldest old. And uh, the definitions of who belongs to the oldest old has changed over time. Currently, we think uh, about the oldest old as those who are 90 years and older, if you want to uh, connect an age uh, to this, as uh, NIH has done. Um, not too long ago, it was actually 85 plus, but then NIH, the National Institutes of Health and Aging, uh, decided there were too many. And so um, uh, it's been narrowed by the NIH for a few years now to the 90 plus age group, but that's only a matter of definition. One way or the other, whether we look at the 85 plus or the 90 plus age group, it is the fastest growing segment of our population. More and more people in the United States and in other parts of the world are surviving into this very, very old age group. And you might be able to see this in, uh, in this graph that I have here uh, prepared for you, um, uh, profiles of aging. This is a worldwide uh, component in here in, in millions. And you can see here in 1980, which at least to my memory, isn't that long ago, the uh, oldest or old, those 90 years and older were barely visible. Um, you know, maybe the group of uh, 90 to 94, this gray line became a little bit visible, but almost uh, not mentionable are those 95 to 99 and then certainly those centenarians, which is why there hasn't been so much attention uh, on this particular age group. But look what's been happening uh, since 1980 uh, and certainly until now around uh, 2020, 2030, We've had a very, very steady and dramatic uh, decline already in the uh, 90 to 94 year old age group, uh, up to um, uh, uh, up to 20 million uh, worldwide, and um, and now um, uh, starting in 2030, when the baby boomers will join those ranks uh, uh, all over the world, we see an even dramatic steeper decline yet to more than 50 million people that will be uh, uh, between 90 and 94 years old. The other two uh, segments, uh, 95 to 99, also are seeing an increase. We notice them now, as you can see in here, the 95 to 99 group is steadily increasing. And, and uh, similar to the early 90s, we see a, a more uh, dramatic and more steeper inc uh, 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 increase in, in numbers from 2030 to 2050, again, only a 20-year period that we're looking at. And uh, then the centenarians in comparison, of course, is still a flatter curve. 
but uh, uh, it is also a visible increase from 2030 to 2050. So taken together, we expect that by 2050, more than 68 million people worldwide will be 90 years and older. Uh, it is a, a change that some of us in gerontology have called the uh, uh, demographic imperative. It is imperative that we are being that we are paying attention to this particular age group, uh, 90 years older, the oldest old age group, because they're de demographically um, uh, increasing in such great numbers. Of course, with that come also a number of problems that we'll talk about uh, uh, later on. You know, as physicians and healthcare providers, you of course see this age group more often than many other people in the community would see them. But they're there, and you know they're there. Certainly the world population of centenarians, uh, the lowest group that I showed you, if you just look at them, we can see a more uh, particular increase in here. Again, barely uh, visible um, in, uh, in 1980. We see uh, and expect this increase from 2030 to 2050 to more than 3 million people who are 100, uh, 100 years uh, and older. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that's uh, certainly uh, no, no surprise. Uh, we, we are waiting, of course, for the census data in 2020, but here in the United States, um, latest estimates have us uh, at about um, 90,000 people who are uh, 100 years and older in the United States. Maybe we'll reach the 100,000 uh, uh, mark. Here in Iowa, uh, we have, uh, again, this is 10 years old, those data, but we have about 800 centenarians uh, who, uh, uh, who we have in the state of Iowa. Um, most likely this number will increase once we get the 2020 data in here. So once again, we don't want to focus just on demographics, but this is an age group that is, um, could, will continue to increase. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in our families, uh, we will notice this. Uh, in your healthcare uh, practices, you will you'll notice it. And in our communities, we'll notice it, uh, that there are more and more people belonging to this age group. So with that, of course, with more and more people joining the ranks of the oldest old adults, the question is, uh, what is their life like? What is the quality of life among this particular age group? And uh, one of the leading um, geriatricians in the, uh, in the Geological Society of America, Jack Rowe, some of you may know uh, the name or know his work, uh, talked about successful aging. And really when he, together with Robert Kahn, a psychologist, developed the concept of successful aging, what they really meant is that there are three different pathways uh, through the aging process. Uh, most of us could probably expect to be here in the, oops, uh, uh, in this uh, usual aging part. Uh, there are changes, but they are not so bothersome that they uh, uh, that that they um, limit our our basic uh, uh, activity of daily living. So there may be hypertension, maybe diabetes, other diseases, chronic diseases that are coming up as people get older, uh, but you can live with them and they don't restrict you. There's another group, of course, that uh, Khan and, uh, uh, and Ro, Ro and Khan have talked about as successful aging or optimal aging. These are people who are unusual uh, in the sense that they have very, very few um, uh, diseases or restrictions um, and, and therefore uh, are optimal. And they really made a good point in their work with the MacArthur study on successful aging, that um, uh, successful aging is achievable for many, many more people than we think. Uh, it is uh, mostly lifestyle and not uh, genetics or conditions that you either accept or do not accept. There's a third group, of course, uh, which uh, we often focus on, and that's pathological aging. And you see this group probably most often. Uh, and uh, Karen Anderson Randberg, uh, one of the leading centenarian researchers, a physician, uh, wrote a, a very um, uh, seminal article with the title, Healthy Centenarians Do Not Exist. Now, again, we can debate this, and we have debated this with her, uh, but uh, certainly as people move through the 80s into the 90s and even hundreds, uh, health becomes often an issue. Uh, and there are chronic diseases, there's multimorbidity, and, of course, frailty and fatigue become uh, more likely as people move into these age groups. And this is... Uh, why we, together with uh, other centenarian teams, started to look at frailty and fatigue, other than these personal experiences that I've had, is it is more likely for people uh, to show these definitions of these signs of frailty and fatigue. So what is it that we actually refer to when we talk about fr uh, uh, frailty? You may know this article. I'm not sure 
your 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 background information, but just in case you don't, uh, this was the lead article in the field of geontology and geriatrics that really talked about uh, frailty. Linda Freed and her team, uh, Teresa Seaman, leading this particular group uh, in uh, talking about frailty in older adults, uh, evidence for a phenotype, and uh, uh, published in 2001. So you know we've talked about frailty. And certainly in your field, probably more often than, than in our field, but it got a lot of attention. And since then, since 2001, in the last 20 years, a lot of attention has been paid uh, to the issue of uh, uh, of frailty. Well, how is it defined? Well, Linda Freed defined it, and this is a definition that's very often uh, used as the basis for, for these analysis. Um, uh, the frailty defined uh, by these four criteria in here, um, in this uh, uh, first uh, subset of bullets. Uh, unintentional weight loss, uh, meaning 10 pounds in, in the past year. Uh, Self-reported exhaustion. Uh, weakness is measured by grip strength, so physical strength. Slow walking speed and low physical activity. And if you look at those four points, uh, Two of them seem to be, at least in our mind, directly related to fatigue uh, rather than uh, uh, sort of overall physical condition. Uh, Self-reported exhaustion, meaning I, I feel exhausted all the time, I'm tired. Uh, and the weakness certainly um, uh, meaning that there's not enough physical strength uh, that people would feel. The other two components on the bottom here, walking speed and low physical activity, both are related to sort of kinesiology aspects to being uh, able to to uh, uh, to, to walk, uh, and, uh, uh, and these are important uh, components, obviously, of frailty. And then there's a nutritional component that seems to be important, but yeah, out of line with some of these others when you talk about strength and and walking speed and physical activity. But nonetheless, those are the four criteria that are very typically used. Of course, we then were more interested in focusing on uh, exhaustion or fatigue and weakness, as you'll see it on. Even though this is the classic definition and the classic diagnosis of, uh, of frailty in our field, we should say that there are alternative uh, frailty indices. Um, uh, there's more than one or two, but the one <clears throat> that I wanted to also focus on is the 30, uh, FI34 a frailty index uh, developed by Kim et al. Uh, 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 Michael Jaswinski, one of my um, centenarian colleagues, um, uh, have uh, developed uh, an index of 34 health items uh, for measuring uh, frailty uh, and relating it then to biological age. That seems to be quite a bit from, from my perspective, and I've talked with, with uh, these authors about this, because they're really putting almost everything in there. Any disease you can think about, whether it's uh, uh, obesity, hypertension, uh, any major diseases, but also depression, cognitive functioning, <coughs> and functional uh, abilities, such as activities of daily living. So uh, that's only to say there's, there's a lot of variety in here uh, in how to define <coughs> frailty. Okay, now, how do I move forward here? Oh, there we go. The same classic article that I referenced before by Linda Freed um, uh, made the case for the issue of uh, frailty by indicating what is the prevalence in the community dwelling population, and uh, that was mentioned as 6.9%. Now, this is not a particular age group. Uh, it's just uh, uh, generally in the community dwelling population because obviously you can have frailty at age 60, at 50, or even earlier than that. Freed and others pointed out that uh, uh, frailty, um, the prevalence is higher in women than men. Of course, uh, some of that is uh, uh, self-reported, even though those four components I mentioned uh, uh, are uh, directly tested. Uh, and then uh, frailty is associated with being African-American, uh, lower education and income, poor health, overall health, higher rates of uh, comorbid chronic diseases, and then disability. It's no surprise because we're obviously measuring uh, uh, the uh, uh, the activity levels uh, that, that people have. And of course, the higher rates of comorbidity comor was mentioned in the uh, uh, frailty index 34. It is part of that. So again, it's no, no surprise, but there are some more at risk groups, obviously, perhaps those that are in other ways, uh, uh, disadvantaged economically, health-wise, so forth and so on, something to pay attention to. Uh, frailty also not only is associated with specific demographics or health variables, it also predicts outcome variables. And that's why it has become such an important uh, index to uh, focus on 
uh, it predicts falls, which uh, obviously can uh, create uh, additional complications, worsening of mobility or ADL disability. Uh, it's associated with higher hospitalization rates and death. And those risk ratios uh, range anywhere from 1.8 to 4.46, meaning you're at least twice, if not four or five times as likely if you are frail uh, to uh, experience any of these uh, uh, kind of uh, health uh, conditions that you might want to pay attention to. So uh, obviously, this is enough evidence to say frailty is a, is a syndrome that we need to uh, pay attention to. Well, having said that, uh, as I indicated, our particular emphasis is on fatigue as one component of, uh, of frailty. And that is because, uh, 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 because of our emphasis on lifestyle and, uh, and on psychological aspects. Um, but you know, certainly there's also physical fatigue, as you will see here on, uh, on the bottom. So um, we wanted to look specifically at, at that one component, not to say that the overall frailty syndrome is not important as well. We just have done focused our work on, on fatigue. So for the rest uh, of my presentation, I, I'll primarily focus on, uh, on aspects of fatigue. So starting again with the definition, there are many definitions on, on fatigue, uh, but they all share some similarities. So this is probably a, a good one that we have uh, used or based our work on. A subjective state of overwhelming sustained exhaustion. So there's that term that's being used in frailty and a decreased capacity for physical and mental work that is not relieved by rest. So again, you know, we all feel tired at times. Um, we may be overworked and then at the end of the day, we'll say, well, I feel so tired. Well, that is fatigue, but it's not in the classical sense, a state uh, that cannot be relieved by rest. So hopefully by the next day, if you had your seven, eight hours of sleep, you'd feel rested and be ready to go again. The components of fatigue that we are looking at uh, by using the uh, 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 the uh, multidimensional fatigue scale developed by Smets and others uh, does exactly what it suggests. It has multiple dimensions. So there's a general fatigue uh, component that we can look at. There's the physical fatigue uh, that people might uh, focus on. Uh, we ask about just reduced activity. You don't have uh, as much to drive to be active anymore as you used to, but also reduced motivation. Uh, that I'm not motivated to do uh, things anymore. These are all signs of fatigue. And then certainly also mental fatigue, which uh, indicates that people uh, uh, are just mentally exhausted. And we see this now uh, during the coronavirus. We often hear about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, corona or COVID fatigue. And that's uh, what I often mentioned. Maybe people don't exercise as much and are also physically fatigued, but there's a lot of mental fatigue uh, right now that we see, that we hear about, and perhaps you see in, uh, in, in your healthcare setting where people are just mentally fatigued. We want this to be over with. We can't take it anymore. Those are all signs of fatigue too that certainly have an important role to play in people's lives. So uh, we, need to, uh, we need to pay attention to that uh, obviously as well. So as I indicated, uh, we were particularly interested in how fatigue relates to depression, because as I indicated, our centenarians had high depression scores, but uh, they did not seem to be fatigued. So if you look at the, the signs and symptoms mentioned by the National Institute of Mental Health of what uh, are the uh, uh, symptoms of, uh, of depression, then you see the typical components of being sad, anxious, uh, hopeless, being irritable, feeling guilt, uh, feeling rest, uh, uh, feeling sleepy, uh, not having enough appet appetite on the bottom of this list here, thoughts of death and suicide. All of those are real. All of these are important. But the two that are mentioned here in red for the purpose of our discussion here today is that there are always uh, items in, in most, if not all, depression scales that focus on uh, decreased energy or fatigue and moving or talking more slowly. Moving more slowly, obviously, also one of those uh, uh, fatigue items um, that uh, do not necessarily, in all age groups, we would argue, indicate depression. Because if somebody says, I don't have the same energy that I used to have as a 20-year-old, I would not call them depressed. Uh, but uh, if, uh, uh, if a college student tells me, I never have enough energy, I can't get up in the morning, that's very, very different uh, for this particular age group. So we actually um, conducted uh, a study looking more specifically at this, uh, and uh, uh, and focusing um, uh, 
focusing on three different age groups. We don't just study centenarians. But what you see here is a group of sexagenarians and then people in their 60s, octogenarians in their 80s, and then centenarians uh, and here on the right side. And these are some of the multidimensional aspects of depression um, as, um, uh, as uh, in, this, in the geriatric depression scale, which is often used to measure depression in older age groups. So you, here you see the uh, component of dysphoria, the sadness component. That's often what uh, we sort of uh, think about when we hear somebody's depressed. They're down, they're sad, they're crying. And then there's also the fatigue components uh, in, in the geriatric depression scale. There's an anxiety component, mental impairness, and hopelessness. And if you start with the summary score, asking are these people, are these all participants depressed, you can see the mean level um, ranging from 0 to 30, uh, is 11.1 for sexagenarians, 11.5 for octogenarians. And then we have this bump up to 13.4, a significant difference uh, between our centenarians and the other two age groups. 60s and 80s are not different from each other, but the centenarians have significantly higher scores. As a matter of fact, if you know the geriatric depression scale, then uh, any score higher than 13 is considered to be a clinically uh, at least mildly depressed. Um, and, uh, and so we are reaching that threshold in here. But then if you look at that first uh, row about dysphoria, you will see that uh, uh, for all groups actually, uh, but certainly also for our centenarian group, um, the, uh, the scores are quite low. The average is one symptom uh, 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 out of uh, the dysphoria items. And that's no different compared to the 60s and the 80s. But if you look at the fatigue scores, you see that uh, uh, that uh, the scores are higher as you move to different age groups. The 80s are higher than the 60s, and the 100s are higher than the 80s in fatigue. And uh, yeah, you may not uh, be so interested in statistics. This is statistically different, but you may also want to look at the size of the effect in here. This is an F value, and the higher the score, the larger the contrast, the larger the difference. And so we have a score of 32. Uh, uh, in this F value, which is far higher than any of the other uh, uh, differences that we see too, like hopelessness or mental impairment. Uh, and so that's why we continue to think that fatigue is one of those major components that we need to pay attention to. We've actually uh, done our work uh, with a particular model and asking ourselves what contributes to fatigue? Why is it that some people, regardless of age, but in this very old age group, are more fatigued than others? And uh, Based on uh, Chen and others, we are dividing this into three aspects. Functional capacity, people who are not active or whose health, self-rated health is worse, are probably more likely to be fatigued. But there are also psychological aspects. Uh, in this case, what we call positive and negative affect, emotionality, positive emotions or negative emotions. And then situational factors, such as the support that you get, the network that you have, and the social support. And we tested this with our oldest old uh, age group. And again, lots of numbers in here, but the story that I want to share with you in here is that, uh, uh, again, we are predicting fatigue. So people in long-term care facilities were more fatigued, no surprise perhaps there. And all the, uh, 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 all the aspects of uh, self-rated health, activities of daily living, and physical activities of daily living, all of those predicted significantly fatigue. So if you were healthier, if you were more active, uh, in instrumental ADLs and physical ADLs, you had lower levels of fatigue. But our psychological uh, variables also indicated that there was a direct effect. So if you were, had positive emotions, you were less likely to be fatigued. If you had negative emotions, you were more likely to fatigue. Then our social network also played a role, not so much the network actually, as the social support system. If you had more social supports, you were less likely to be fatigued. And so that uh, seemed to be an important aspect, aspect for us uh, uh, to pay attention to. Another study where we also looked at predictors of fatigue, this is a longitudinal study we did with, uh, uh, with old and very old age groups. And uh, again, I highlighted the important parts in here, the main predictors of changes in fatigue, would you get more fatigue? So this is not just predicting fatigue, but whether you change, whether you increase in fatigue, it was anxiety, physical activity and nutritional risk. Those three aspects predicted uh, higher levels or lower levels of fatigue. So if you're very anxious, uh, very worried uh, in general about your life, you were also more fatigued. Uh, if you were physically more active, you were less fatigued significantly over time. There were fewer changes, I would say, of fatigue. And you, if you were at nutritional risk, 
you were more likely to become more fatigued over time. Um, uh, at, uh, at time two. This is uh, uh, over a five-year period that we tested uh, uh, our age groups. And then we turned this around and we asked, well, does fatigue at time one predict anything at uh, time two? And this is what you see in here. It essentially was um, only nutritional risk that, uh, 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 that uh, uh, where fatigue at time one predicted change in nutritional risk. So there was a sort of a vicious cycle. If you were at nutritional risk, you became more fatigued. But if you became more fatigued, you also became more at risk, nutritional risk, uh, uh, over time. So here we are now. I have to take some of that back, what I said earlier about uh, frailty. It seems like fatigue and uh, activity, physical activity and nutrition do interact with each other in an important way uh, in, this, uh, in this very old age group that we have in here. Well, this uh, leads me to uh, the last part of my presentation that I wanted to explain to you which is the Healthiest Aims uh, Initiative uh, and the home-based exercise program. I don't know to what extent you know about Healthiest Aims. It is a grassroots initiative, a community activity, uh, a community uh, group that, uh, 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 that is trying to come up with initiatives that help uh, uh, all of us here in Ames to uh, have the healthiest possible life that we can lead. And uh, uh, it all started with the Blue Zones initiative and the Healthiest uh, Iowa initiative years ago that you may remember, uh, where um, the uh, then Governor Brandstad started an initiative to say we want in Iowa to be the healthiest state in the nation. Uh, and of course, uh, that only works if the communities uh, also develop their programs. And so some years ago, uh, we took up the challenge and said we want to be the healthiest uh, community in, uh, in Iowa and develop certain programs. Uh, the most recent initiative you might have seen uh, in the media, uh, newspaper and online, is our face mask initiative for high schools, where um, uh, uh, through our Healthiest Aims initiative, we made sure that every high, uh, not high schools, every school uh, child, elementary to high, to high school, uh, gets uh, at least two masks that they can wear um, uh, at school and, uh, and beyond. But this program started a little bit earlier, before uh, COVID-19, obviously, but as I indicated, probably now as important as ever, where we, uh, I took uh, the lead in uh, developing an initiative for older adults, particularly very old adults, to see can we safely um, uh, test out a demonstration project, a workout program, a fitness program that would increase uh, the, uh, uh, the fitness and, uh, uh, of older adults in our AIMS community and, um, uh, and it decrease any fatigue level that might exist. So Healthiest Aims is the general uh, starting point, but this is an initiative that was uh, uh, conducted together with uh, Iowa State University, obviously in, in, uh, in my uh, aspect and uh, Warren Frankie's uh, faculty member status. Uh, but we also had Mary Greeley participate in this, uh, Heart and Senior Services, and the Ames Public Library, interestingly enough, that uh, allowed us to, uh, uh, to access uh, uh, their facilities for programs, but also uh, with a long range goal of educating people about the importance of uh, exercise and being able to do it safely at home. And uh, as you see on here, I have here in my uh, hand these, the workout to go brochure, which was developed by the National Institutes of Health or Aging. Uh, and that is the starting point that we used. Uh, what we needed were basically some uh, uh, weights to uh, increase um, um, uh, strength in individuals. So they, they came in three, five, and eight pounders. Uh, for uh, strength, we also use these um, uh, friendly sweets, as they're called, that you can squeeze uh, to increase the strength. Very comfortable. Of course, we can also use tennis balls, if you will. And uh, we also, uh, funded by uh, the uh, Story County uh, Foundation, uh, bought these Fitbits, uh, Fitbit Zips, uh, that we ask people to wear over uh, the intervention program and the eight-week program to see uh, whether that made a difference or not. So in case you have not seen this, the Healthiest Aims initiative has uh, four uh, particular components, healthy food choices, the nutritional aspect, which we're not focusing on in, in this program, uh, chronic disease management, uh, uh, again, which perhaps we have an indirect effect on, but not directly, community connectedness, uh, which again, as we talk about home-based exercise, uh, uh, is uh, less likely to occur. So our focus was really here on physical activity and uh, increase, increasing or maintaining strength and decreasing uh, fatigue aspects of it. 
you can you can find uh, more information about Healthiest Aims on our uh, website, Healthiest Aims. Uh, if you Google that, you'll you'll get right uh, right into that. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to develop, implement, and evaluate a home-based exercise program for older adults, uh, particularly oldest older adults in the Ames community. We used the uh, Go for Life uh, initiative and Workout to Go program. And we asked our participants to uh, do the, a program for eight weeks uh, just to see, uh, can we already see the effect after a relatively short amount of time after these eight weeks? And then we would do a pre-test and a post-test evaluation to see whether uh, we see any any direct, uh, any specific uh, effects in here. We had uh, 49 participants in this demonstration project uh, that, that stayed with us for these eight weeks. Mean age was 77.4 years, 35 women, 14 men. Um, again, marriage status, 32 were married, 10 widowed, 4 never married. Education level, of course, here in Ames, uh, quite high compared to others. Uh, but again, um, we believe that uh, a workout is good for everybody. So we took uh, uh, everybody who wanted to, who heard about it and wanted to participate. Now, what we wanted to find out is whether there's any uh, change in perceived health. Uh, do people feel healthier? whether there's any effect on cognitive functioning, any effect on activities of daily living uh, after these eight weeks. Uh, what about social supports? We've heard about that before. Are people more satisfied in their lives? Uh, even though you do it at home, perhaps because you're connected with our staff, uh, does uh, just doing an activity like this, community activity like this, uh, create uh, or change loneliness scores? And of course, we were interested primarily in fatigue. Do fatigue levels change? And then what about fitness levels? And we used uh, the so-called fitness, uh, CD fitness test. Uh, you may know some of those uh, uh, markers, a chair stand, arm curls, left and right, stepping in place, sitting and reaching, and back scratch, and the eight foot up and go um, uh, measured by uh, walking speed. So these are all components that would go into either fatigue or a frailty as a, as a measure. So what did we find out? I'll just walk you through some of the findings in here over uh, after eight weeks. Uh, and, and again, I, I summarize a number of those. Uh, what you see in here for the chair stand is uh, uh, in terms of uh, fitness, uh, uh, agility, uh, um, uh, mobility aspects of it. Uh, in, uh, and again, these are all, when I pointed out, these are all significant increases, not just uh, uh, in percentage, but we have a significant uh, increase in the, in the measured chair stand uh, fitness after only those eight weeks uh, uh, that, uh, that people uh, engage in. Uh, then, uh, in terms of arm curls, again, left and right, uh, as, uh, as we can see in here, in both cases, uh, we see an average of an 8% increase uh, in strength after only eight weeks, that people are uh, more likely to do these uh, arm curls. And we had a number of people who said, I started with three pounds, can I move up to five pounds? And so, actually, in between, they changed to higher levels because they felt more comfortable with, uh, with uh, more weights that they had uh, 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 to work with. Uh, the the uh, uh, sit and reach aspect, you again, you may know this uh, exercise, you're sitting on a chair and you're trying to reach your, your toes. And so what we measure is the difference between your, uh, your uh, fingertips and your, and your toe. And that's where you see the red line here going down. So that distance uh, between an inches uh, between reaching uh, toward your toes is significantly, highly significantly uh, decreased uh, uh, over time. Back scratch is, is not, it's a little bit more difficult to do, uh, but we certainly see an effect on flexibility is really what we're measuring. Actually, I didn't mention this before, but the workout to go uh, component measures uh, uh, flexibility, uh, measures um, strength, obviously, as we've noticed, and measures balance, uh, three uh, important aspects uh, of, uh, of uh, fitness and, uh, uh, and uh, non-fatigue or, or energy. Interestingly enough, we had people in this age group uh, measure their, uh, and write down every, every week their uh, number of steps. And so here, what I showed to you is just the beginning and the end uh, of it. There's no change in number of steps that this age group had, but we think that they were probably motivated to begin to do very well. So as they saw their steps from the beginning, we didn't we didn't measure them without knowing they would be in an intervention. And so, um, you know, they, the, to me, the remarkable thing is that they kept it up. So um, just as many steps uh, uh, at, after eight weeks as it was in the beginning in here. And uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, really quite high, we think, for, for this particular age group is to have an average of 6,500 steps uh, every, every day as an average uh, seems quite remarkable. So even though no change, we think uh, uh, the, maybe the Fitbit itself uh, even showed that there's an, uh, an increase in it. And of course, as a psychologist, I was interested, uh, what about life satisfaction? Is there any change in, in that? And yes, indeed, there was. People had a purpose, as we often say. You have to have a purpose. You have to have a focus, particularly if you can't leave home, as it is now with, with COVID-19. And just to have a task, to be part of a program, to set your own program even, and to motivate yourself and see that you're doing better uh, does seem to make a difference. We saw in eight weeks a 5.5% increase in life satisfaction. And we also saw a 15% increase in cognitive functioning. Uh, again, a very uh, quick test, obviously, of cognitive functioning using the uh, uh, MOCA uh, uh, assessment um, that uh, you may have heard about uh, particularly recently. Uh, but uh, we definitely saw a 50% increase in cognitive functioning uh, after those eight, uh, eight weeks. Uh, interesting enough, if you look at fatigue, the solid score here on the bottom, we did not see an in increase or decrease. It was almost exactly the identical score. But we were thinking that, you know, this workout, as it may seem easy to some of us, is quite challenging. We didn't ask them to do all 13 exercises. We gave them a whole worksheet, uh, do seven, half of these exercises uh, in one day, then the other half the next day, and then take one day, Sunday, or whatever day you want off. Um, and, uh, and so people did tell us this was, this, at least in the beginning, it was uh, quite demanding, and maybe it still was even after eight weeks. So the fatigue levels did not uh, decrease. They didn't increase, even though they were more physically active. Uh, so that's some way to think about it. Uh, we looked at a few demographic differences in here. Women scored higher in flexibility, uh, particularly the back scratch than men do. Uh, women and more educated participants had higher fitness scores overall, as measured by the chair stands. And older old adults reported fewer steps in post-test than younger old adults by about 150 steps. So not dramatic. If we have six and a half thousand, we have, we'd still measure 6,300 or so for this uh, uh, older, old uh, uh, age group. Again, remarkable, but remember, we asked people to get more active and perhaps that was prompting uh, this. So by and large, uh, uh, asking, is, was it successful? We, we would say yes. Uh, we could see measurable effects, but more so when people came back, I sat down with a number of them and asked them, what was it like? What did you observe? What worked? What didn't work? And here are some of the uh, qualitative responses that I received. Program was great. It kept me on track. So again, uh, a prescribed program really makes a difference rather than just to say exercise. It's good for you. Uh, I feel uh, that I'm stronger. So obviously subjectively, but also objectively, we've seen that. The Fitbit motivated me to walk more. So again, just measuring a number of steps. We all know this. If we have used the fit, uh, uh, Fitbit, uh, we'll do this. I enjoyed the interaction with the students because they came uh, we also had some programs that people could come to the library that the students ran, and so that might have made a difference too. The homework sheets were so helpful. I made more copies for myself to continue. So we gave them enough for the eight weeks, but uh, just to actually mark what they had done uh, uh, in, in, in that amount of time. And so again, a prescribed homework sheet uh, was so helpful that they, at least immediately afterwards, it's been a while since we finished, but uh, uh, people kept continuing to do it. The program was demanding at first, but it got easier over time. That's exactly what you want to hear to build up strength uh, in uh, individuals. It was fun to do. Well, that's good to hear. Not everybody thinks that exercise or starting an exercise program is fun. I could feel a difference every week. I started with three-pound weights, but after a while, I bought, I bought myself five-pound weights. Uh, and, uh, and so, again, the motivation to, uh, to do more. And then my kids encouraged me to keep up with the exercises. So that's the sort of support. Uh, aspect that obviously can be very important too. So I'm almost out of time here. I look at my timer and uh, let me summarize so what we think we have found out in here. First and foremost, fatigue, frailty are critical issues in very late life. I'm more convinced than ever with our centenarian studies and with our healthiest aim study, we really do see that, uh, that this is critical. When fatigue increases, a lot of functions go and there's a lot of what we call accelerated decline that we can see. Personality, like anxiety or uh, worriness, nutritional risk, uh, obviously physical activity, but even social support, they're all related to fatigue. 
uh, some as risk factors and some as protective factors. And so we certainly are quite confident that we not only know about uh, uh, fatigue, we also know what is related to it. And I'm sure there are other components too that we haven't looked at yet. And then uh, trying to uh, make it more applied after eight weeks in the exercise program, we see significant changes in strength, flexibility, cognition, and life satisfaction. People were more able to do uh, arm curls, uh, uh, cognition improved significantly. Uh, participants were more flexible and life satisfaction, of course, also improved. So again, with a small program, with a, lar with a small number of people and only a few exercises, only over a few weeks, we can demonstrate clear effects in here. And here are just uh, a few uh, uh, pictures from uh, our pre-test uh, or post-test, I don't know which one it was, in here our educational system uh, that one of our students ran in the library and the wonderful people, students uh, and uh, members of the uh, Healthiest Aims Physical Activity Group um, uh, that participated in, uh, in our work. So uh, uh, that uh, is it. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, I uh, think uh, we may still have a few minutes. Actually, we have a couple of minutes here for questions or comments. People are fatigued by my, uh, I hope people are not becoming fatigued by my presentation. I know there is mental fatigue. <laughs> Zoom fatigue, people call it too. Uh, we all know, but it's an interesting time. I haven't really talked much about COVID-19, but a lot of these things, obviously, if I can answer my own question or make my own comment in here, of what I've left out. Uh, as we are now more cooped in, uh, we're not, uh, not only that we can't, well, we can go to a fitness center, obviously, but some people, particularly risk groups, that's one of the people that I work with, older adults and oldest old adults. Um, uh, as we are more um, uh, uh, you know, caught in our own homes, uh, we think, uh, even though we developed this program before COVID-19, that now uh, is, again, a very important time to, time to encourage people, and I hope every healthcare professional would, is to, um, uh, uh, to keep up uh, exercise uh, and activity at home, uh, uh, or still it isn't getting cold. Now that it's getting cold, it's even, you know, it's more demanding that we, uh, uh, that we keep up uh, our mental and physical uh, strength uh, and don't get uh, fatigued. Stay connected with other people, yes, um, uh, but also in a measured way so that uh, we don't all have, uh, that we don't all suffer from Zoom fatigue, as it were. And uh, again, you see my email down there, pxmartin at isd.edu. If you have any comments or questions you want to send my way, I'd be more than happy to uh, uh, to uh, see your comments if they come uh, uh, later. Um, and uh, if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions for our lab of what to do or where to go, uh, I, I would very much appreciate it. So thank you again. I, I, I miss seeing you, but I trust you out there. Stay healthy and stay um, uh, uh, stay fit and energized and uh, keep keep up your strength thank you very much <laughs>